The interesting thing with photography is that we all have different setups, big cameras, small cameras, Sony, Canon or Fujifilm, but they are all doing the same thing, capturing light and making it an image we can look at. The other main element of photography is our environment, which if we take two photographers, Max and Louise, let's say, living in the same city, doing photography at the same time, the environment is technically the exact same. So what will differentiate the images of Max from Louise's ones is whether he decided to incorporate the environment, to what degree, and how he did it compared to Louise. Beyond the technicalities of each and every one setup, film versus digital, wide versus long focal length, I always find very interesting to study how other photographers are using their environment to enhance their images, trying what I observed myself in my own environment, and ultimately decide consciously, or more often than not unconsciously, to use certain ways of playing with the environment that will define my photography style in the long run. What I truly love about street photography, or whatever you want to call it, is the unstaged aspect of it. You cannot give directions to your subjects, even more so if they are not actual humans. You cannot move the light, change its temperature, uh, change the backdrop, or play with props. You have a set of parameters, from the tools you are using, the location you're at, to the weather conditions that you have to deal with and play with to your best advantage. So today's video topic is two composition tricks or techniques that I use regularly to incorporate and or twist my environment that have been very detrimental to my progression in photography and at defining my shooting style. The first one is commonly known under the name of the Dutch tilt. It is this composition technique where you deliberately tilt the camera to achieve an inclined or tilted perspective. The horizon ends up being not parallel to the bottom of the frame. It is often used in filmmaking to create a sense of imbalance and visual tension. But in my opinion, when it comes to photography and still images, it can create a variety of other feelings. And maybe surprisingly, what I try to achieve when I use it is more about finding balance and more harmony in my compositions. Practically speaking, there is not a rigid and defined way to do the Dutch tilt. It doesn't say that if you tilt more or less than a certain angle, it is not a Dutch tilt anymore, but still, in most cases, your angle will sit between 15 up to 45 or 50 degrees. If you tilt just a little, it can look like you failed at making your image perfectly leveled, and in contrast, if you tilt too much, we start to naturally understand whether it's supposed to be a vertical or horizontal image. Like I said before, I don't use the Dutch tilt to provoke a sense of unease or disorientation. For me it is more about finding a better harmony, more balance in my compositions. When I'm facing a scene and notice that a perfectly leveled composition is not really working well, I start tilting my camera to see if there is an angle that works better for that scene. I am not thinking about how uncomfortable the viewer will feel, but how with the addition of a tilt I can incorporate more of the sky, more of the foreground. Sometimes it can be a building that if I twist my camera a certain way, I can incorporate more of the interesting pattern engraved on it. It can also be that if I tilt my camera, I can make make a certain area of the scene to fall into one of the third to make my composition stronger. What I noticed with time is that I am much more inclined to use this touch tilt technique when I'm using a prime lens. There are times where there is just not enough room to adjust your position to have all the desired elements in your frame, so tilting can be that other solution to get you where you want to go, capturing the scene with everything inside. Another thing you can achieve when you make good use of the touch tilt technique is twisting your environment and make it something new. Depending on the scene and the focal length you're using, the intensity of that effect will vary. With wider lenses you will still be able to recognize probably all the elements included in the scene, but with longer lenses you can really start tapping into more abstract scenes. That said, even when most things composing your frame are still recognizable, the viewer's perspective will be twisted to the point of feeling like they are watching something completely new. It doesn't get as painting-like and as abstract as when you are photographing a reflection in a puddle or something like that, but at least for me, when I look at a photo where the Dutch tilt has been used in a skillful way, Way, I can't help thinking that it looks almost like a piece from a different visual art. The photo doesn't really show a road, a street or a building anymore, but a combination of line, shapes, colors and light pockets. You can also play with the tempo when using the Dutch tilt. Sometimes it adds dynamism to your images, but other time it can add some sort of a levitating, floating effect. Even with the introduction and a decrease in price of more and more ways to make photos and videos as stable as possible, I'm thinking about gimbals, in-body stabilization, 
visualization, this kind of thing, we still see filmmakers and photographers intentionally adding camera shakes and angle tilts. There is a place for leveled, stabilized images, but a tilt or camera shake is very powerful at making an image more dynamic. It adds a sense of taken on the fly, taking that unique photo opportunity, even though you were still walking or even almost running while taking it. The photo itself gets this dynamic feeling, but also it goes into the viewer's imagination, trying to figure out how and why the photographer could not take a perfectly leveled picture. As I said before, in other times it can also add some sort of a floating effect, almost like the photographer was somewhere without gravity, having his whole body tilting without being able to control it. I love listening to some ambient floating kind of music, and when I look at the photo utilizing the Dutch tilt, it really reminds me of these kind of songs. I guess you are more likely to be familiar with that second composition technique I'm gonna talk about, but I still want to add my little grain of salt. It's of course the addition of foreground, which I've been using more and more since moving to Japan. I know a lot of you really like the Japan aesthetics, the temples, the shrines, but also the urban landscape, and some said that whatever you photograph here, you will get bangers 100% of the time. After more than two years here and past that novelty feeling you get just after moving to a new place, I can really tell you that it's definitely not the case, and what I started to notice is how cluttered the streets are. They are super clean and they are famous worldwide for this, so I am not commenting on that. I am talking here about how many signs, flags, cones, warning messages, and all that sort of little mess you can see in the streets. In such a cluttered landscape, you have to find ways to simplify your compositions to get easier to read and more impactful images. And playing with foreground elements is definitely one of the best tools you have to achieve that. And by the way, I think it is easier to achieve when you're using a focal length more around 40, 50 and above. The addition of foreground will come in handy at simplifying a scene, getting rid of the visual noise that comes from all sort of mess I listed before. In an ideal scenario, you want that foreground to be visually interesting, and that leads me to my second point. Foreground can help simplifying a scene, yet at the same time, it adds another layer of complexity to your images. It may sound counterintuitive, but a layer of complexity is nothing like the mess I talked about before, and it can really enhance a photograph. Texture, colors, context, interesting shapes. If the pole, the window, the wall, or the post box you are using as a foreground include one of these, you are heading in the right direction to improve your compositions. Unlike visual noise that is tiring to look at, the right foreground adds a layer that the viewer can take time to analyze, leading him to spend more time looking at a photo and giving him the time it deserves. Last but not least, foreground elements can serve as a guide. You must be familiar with the concept of frame within a frame, or leading lines to guide the viewer's eye where you want him to look. Oftentimes we think about symmetry, a row of trees or a road to serve as leading lines to draw the viewer's attention to our subject, but a foreground element can do just the same. It can play the role of saying to the viewer that he has to focus to one specific area of the frame. Sometimes it can also be a bit more playful, with for example a window reflection with some elements of text or drawings that create different little pockets where you could place your subject. Other times it can be a metal barrier with some interesting pattern that also creates different subframe where you can place your subject or subjects for an even more striking composition. When trying to get these kind of photos, I would strongly advise you to lock your focus, either by using full manual focus or if you use the back button focusing method, you can pre-focus somewhere you expect the subject to walk in so you don't have to worry about your autofocus acting crazy at the critical moment. So 
these were the two composition techniques I wanted to talk about today. Sometimes I even use both of them together. It is not either or. Now if this was interesting and new to you, there's only one thing left to do, picking up your camera and trying for yourself. I think they are great because you can be really creative and less reliant on your location and how exciting are your surroundings. Great for you if you think there is nothing interesting to shoot around where you live. So have fun experimenting with it and let's catch up in the next one. Bye.